um, I am Peter Solagna. Uh, I work for EGI.eu as well as a senior operation manager. And I prepared a set of slides to introduce you about uh, the AAI uh, services, the status of the actual current services in EGI, and uh, the plans that we have for their evolution and the possibilities that we have for their evolution uh, and of course this evolution process will be based also on the uh, on your uh, requirements on your feedback <clears throat> so this is the outline of the um, presentation uh, we'll start with the generic let's say a more generic introduction on the on the AAI uh, topics uh, in a federated environment, particularly focusing on the challenges of AAI in a federated environment. Uh, and then I will have some slides about the current state of the art of EGI. Then, as I said before, the evolution, the, the plans, the proposals for evolutions, um, how to evolve AAI services in EGI. And then I will conclude with a summary. Um, so I will, if you, if there is something very unclear in some slides or there are urgent questions, I will check if there are hands raised uh, between slides. So please feel free to to raise hands. And of course, the the, the longest questions probably would be better to keep them to the end. <clears throat> so uh, I will start then with the with the generic introduction. On the on the AI topics in a federated environment, uh, starting with the user authentication. So, what what are the, the the differences between user authentication in a local environment and in a federated environment? So, how it works using in a local environment? Let's say you want to log in into your institution services or in to access one cluster that is maintained by a system administrator. What user have usually is a local account, meaning that it has been validated in a face-to-face -face verification with a system administration. Usually how it goes is that the new users actually walk into the office of the system administrator it maybe sign a paperwork or agree on the on the username and they, they receive the credential username and password please change your password in x days and and they can access the service but this information are actually uh, you know this information are actually um, stored in a local database they are known accessible only by few people probably the system administrators of the cluster and they get all the information they need from the user because they know the user or user he's if not a local user has a referent a referee in their institution so it, it may not be as complicated in a local environment what so that's the difference with a federated environment users don't cannot have local account in every ser service provider, in every cluster, in every uh, computing center they want to access. EGI, as, as Kerge said, EGI is, um, has more than 300 computing centers. Let's say that, of course, a user community may access <clears throat> 100 of computer centers, most probably in a best case scenario, or anyway, tens of them. So users needs to have their or single account for the whole EGI to access the different service provided, different service distributed in Europe. Um, and the credentials that are used by the user need to be uh, recognized and accepted by every service provider in the Federation. Uh, they need in particular that um, and in particular, it's important for the user that their identity is uniform across the different service provider. If I am Peter Solania in one side, I need to be Peter Solania in all the sides because in the end, the Federation will put together this information about what I did in the, in the infrastructure to, for example, to produce accounting. Or I need to access data here and there. And I don't want to remember how I was called in that, in that 
Resource Center, right? Um, what one of the challenges in this federated environment is that the credentials are not generated by the service providers, so are not generated by the by the site administrators, er, as Unix account are generated in a local environment. So identity providers and service providers must agree on some baseline some policies. So what are the information that the identity provider uh, who generates the, the credential for the users um, can provide to the service provider? Uh, what is the level of assurance of the credential? So how trustworthy are those credentials? and the information that are contained in these credentials. And uh, how the identity providers or the service provider will react to service requests. Uh, how, how is the incident handling for the service provider or for the uh, identity provider processes are. All these information uh, are needed to build a, a trust framework where different entities, and we have actually three main groups of entities, the users, the identity providers who provide credential to the users, and the service provider that need to be accessed by the users and that then, and who must accept the credential released by the identity providers. So all of this uh, must be built uh, with policies, with agreement, and in practice with trust. As I said, a user, user must be able to keep his identity on every, uh, the same identity in the distributed services. Uh, why this is important for the user? So, uniform authentication, I am who I am in every site, um, enables me to, uh, to, to run cross-site workflows. I can run a process in one service which is in one site and I can write read data uh, into another site and this data will be owned by me since I'm authenticated with the same identity in both sites and of course as a this is because I, I, I as a user want to be able to use distributed resources uh, using the same credential I, I own from the service provider point of view, it's also very important to, that the user um, keeps the same identity in the different sites because uniform authentication improves the, the security operation in a federated environment. Uh, misbehaving users can be uh, suspended in, for their action more easily if they have one single credential that's used in every site. Uh, if a, I mean, doesn't need to be uh, malicious users. Can happen that a user is submitting some applications, some jobs that are actually uh, for some configuration problems are causing a denial of service to uh, to some other uh, EGI or infrastructure services. So it's better to temporarily suspend the, the the jobs of this user. If the user submitted thousands of jobs in tens of sites. It's easier to, to act very quickly, also uh, for the benefit of the user, and temporarily suspend his or her jobs uh, with one click, because it's very easy if the user has the same identity. And uh, <clears throat> it's easier also to, um, to, to, to manage the, the authorization to implement the rules for the for the authorization of the user, if the the user has the same uh, the same ID, so every site basically can configure use the same configuration to to regulate authorization of users, um, and ultimately also this is also for accounting uh, resources. It's easier to account the usage of resources if we can track the activities of the user across sites. Um, now in this slide I'd like to, to, to talk about another concept which is very important in distributed environment which is the delegation. 
So for some workflows, some workflows, sorry, need delegation, meaning that there are applications that in general need to access data stored by the user in another site um, and and record or in the same site but uh, stored in another uh, iteration in another day um, and also to um, <clears throat> to allow that portals uh, scientific gateways I will talk more about them later on uh, can act on behalf of the user, application can act on behalf of the user to make uh, easier for the user to r do big numbers of tasks, to run big number of tasks, to to run big numbers of action in a distributed environment without constant need of interactive access. Um, so there are two ways to to implement delegation. Uh, the first is the impersonation, so application can impersonate in the user, which is actually how the how the uh, it works at the moment in EGI. User provides the user if the user wants that an application or a service um, does um, actions on his behalf, the user provides um, short-term, usually a short-term credentials, um, a, rep a short-term uh, replica of his credentials uh, to the service so that it can be used only by that service for a short period of time to do the job he wants. In that case, the service is authenticated in the infrastructure as the user. The other way is to uh, it will be the actual delegation. So it's done at authorization level, where the the user authorizes the service to act on his behalf. This is at the moment this is a little more complicated uh, to to implement in EGI. So most of the delegation is actual impersonation in EGI. Nevertheless, this is a very very useful tool, which is particularly relevant when uh, users are accessing big resources, uh, big numbers and running a lot of uh, application, a lot of jobs, moving a lot of data. Even moving data from one side to another, if can be done uh, by a third service, requires delegation to, to, for, the, for the file transfer service to move data from site A to B. He, the, sorry, it needs as well to, to access the data in the two sites if it is protected for the user. <clears throat> Another, uh, uh, let's say, feature of the, of the cre credential is the level of assurance. What does it mean? It means that basically not all the credentials are the same. You, of course, are most probably aware of it. There are very high-level uh, IDs, very high-level credentials. For example, the uh, EIDs uh, released by governments. Uh, there are very high-level as well, or high-level uh, of assurance uh, IDs. For example, the, the X509 certificates. Uh, that I will tell you about more later, uh, but also many institutional identity provider, your institutional identity provider probably is checking, for example, the ID of the of the users before creating an account, or of course if if an employer provides a credential to an IDP, an identity uh, provider service to to their employees, they, they know their their identities very well. Uh, there are, of course, other medium level of credential, and there are the, the lower level of credential. For example, the, the social media credential. Everyone with an email account can basically ask for it. Um, but uh, let's say not all the application requires high level of credential, uh, more high level of assurance. Of course, it wouldn't hurt to have them, but in the end, can be also very expensive for users, service provider, identity providers to maintain high-level uh, credential for every user when uh, when it it is not needed. Um, so, the, the point is that 
how can we choose which credential minimum level of assurance credential we need and this is not only for the service provider so it's for the service provider because to run some action on their services to to release their resources to a users they may want to have some level of credential if you want to access if a one user wants to access generic information like uh, wiki pages or open data or access uh, public domain data or open a tier request ticket he may not need for example high level of assurance um, if a user wants to use 100,000 CPU time or store one petabyte of data then it probably service provider would like to make sure that who's doing that is ultimately accountable for for what he's doing is consuming resources and money <clears throat> and also the users uh, the user community may require uh, to have good authentication of users because for example they are handling sensitive data which is um, which is uh, uh, cannot be released to everyone so they may need to to have um, high level of assurance credential okay so uh, I talked a little bit or a lot about authentication uh, and now there is the second second level the second A of the AAI which is authorization uh, again in a federated environment because it's slightly different it's again easy to write rules can be uh, demanding in terms of time but it's easy to write to access rules in a local environment user by user but in a federated environment service provider just can't handle authorization uh, based on individual users service provider website uh, sorry um, EGI site uh, managers they don't know who the user is why he should access or not access some services that are uh, pledged to a VO for example um, sorry to a user community for example and um, and and this uh, what what service provider can do is to apply implement some rules for the authorization based on the, uh, some in additional information associated with the user uh, this information can be provided by the identity provider but the identity provider most probably will not know either what the user is allowed to do within his collaboration but let me give you an example uh, within a user community a service provider should uh, know which user who which users can uh, overwrite the application data software of that user community which is configured at every uh, every in every site the the service provider doesn't know because don't know specifically how the collaboration is organized the adp uh, neither but what the service provider can do is to uh, allow this action on the user who have a specific attributes that describe them as software managers for example and who is going to who's going to to set up this is of course the the, the, the user community the the pi the, the 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 managers of this collaboration who should choose and assign the the people to this task so what uh, service provider do on one side is to allow access to the member of a research community and to identify what are the actions that these members can do um, and then the user community should put the right people in the right position to to who can do some of these actions or cannot do some of these actions <clears throat> so as I said in the previous slide, uh, how the distributed collaboration management is implemented in EGI is done through the virtual organization. What is a virtual organization? Is a research community, let's say, uh, a group of researchers with common interests, meaning most probably also working on similar topics, research topics, but 
they have particular uh, it's more important for a service provider standpoint it's more important that they have similar requirements common requirements common use case common application that can be implemented and deployed in the infrastructure um, and the these researchers also need to work collaboratively and or also share resources so virtual organization may own resources uh, or access to distributed resources and they want to put them to share them among their collaboration they want to share the software they want to share the, the data for example so all these assets uh, are shared or can be shared within a virtual organization <clears throat> As I said uh, before, in EGI, service provider allow access to users to the resources based on the VO, the virtual organization membership, and the roles and the groups of the users within this virtual organization, which can be translated basically in attributes associated to the users. Uh, I can tell you that the difference between groups and roles is that the group attributes are fixed, meaning that a user always brings with his uh, or her credentials the, the attributes of the groups, while the roles can be chosen uh, based on the action that the user want, wants to, to perform in the specific moment. Who is, let's say, putting together this information for the service provider? Uh, mainly the VO manager. Uh, he's the main contact with EGI as well. He knows the user, so he can help, uh, give to the user the right attributes. Um, and what most important is that VO Manager has the capability to add new users, remove users, suspend users, change their attributes without the need to notify to the service provider any change, because this is automatically. Um, um, because service providers don't uh, configure user by user in their site, so they don't need to keep up with the changes in the, in the collaboration. Um, what VO Manager don't do usually is to manage the user credential, which are provided by uh, other identity providers. So VO, the virtual organization is not an identity provider in most cases. <clears throat> so this is the, this, the first part. This was the first part, the generic introduction on the AAI in federated environment and, um, and a little bit uh, on EGI. So I'm moving now in the second part of the presentation. So what is the state of the art? What do we do now to, to make possible all the things that I described before in EGI? So I don't see hands raised. So I will continue with the next slide. That's one hand raised. Daniele. Um, Diego, can you enable Daniele mic? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so thank you for this uh, introduction to services. It was very clear and uh, <coughs> it was good because it explains the general uh, architecture and, uh, and the way of interaction. So I just need some clarification about the... Um, so basically, let me try to repeat. So let's, get, let's see if I, I got it correctly. Mm -hmm. So. First, you you are splitting basically into three different parts: authentication, authorization, and virtual organization. So, authentication uh, has more to do with uh, okay with credentials and also with different way of uh, of delegating uh, the way of authenticate uh, yeah. to, to a federated system. So, I'm thinking about a, a federated system, a federated environment, uh, where I need uh, uh, delegation. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So first, you you, you told that uh, uh, for uh, short-term tasks, let's say it uh, impersonation is is enough. While for uh, 
maybe uh, tightly coupled uh, and um, and task which requires lots of resources, uh, the delegation is the best uh, way to to implement delegation. Actually, is it right? Yeah. So sorry for in yeah sorry for interrupting here. It's um, so the 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 thing is that maybe the slide was wasn't clear because unfortunately delegation uh, I used delegation twice. So I think <laughs> delegation. In a generic way, it's needed for for both uh, for for these use cases that you mentioned. Uh, then delegation can be done in two ways, and we actually do the the delegation, the impersonation delegation. We don't do the delegation delegation, uh, meaning that in EGI at the moment when we dele when we say delegate, actually service impersonate the user. This is transparent. I mean, it works. It works in both for short and long, um, uh, let's say, um, use cases. Let's say complex or and simple, maybe. Sorry. I mean, let's say complex and simple because, of course, uh, delegating a user who needs to download uh, one PDF. Uh, Impersonation is, impersonation, impersonation is enough, but maybe that to manage a complex task. Uh, so my question is, uh, in order to manage a complex task like, uh, uh, for for example, downloading uh, some, so querying the services, uh, uh, moving uh, some uh, digital objects to the computational resources somewhere else, uh, is impersonation mm -hmm. enough, or we need a delegation? So the it it is it will it works well uh, because it basically as the, as the service impersonates the user uh, he, the service moves data and the data is automatically uh, owned by the user because the service is impersonating the user so the for for the use cases so far it was enough that this doesn't mean that it's uh, it's going to be like this in the future but for the moment okay. all the use cases have been fulfilled yeah Okay, thank you. I also have another question about uh, credentials. So you yep. say that you, you mentioned the different kinds of credentials according to their uh, uh, level of security. But w maybe I didn't get exactly uh, which kind of credentials uh, you can support and which is the degree of interoperability with different systems. Yep. Because in my use uh, case, uh, I have different, uh, different services probably having uh, uh, two or three different. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Yes. So if I can interrupt you, it's just this will be in the next slides. So you will see what we are using now, what we will, how we want to integrate other technologies. But thank you for the question. Okay. I think so, it, I, I hope it will be clear. I have another couple of questions. Sorry, but I want to better understand. So <laughs> um, I also have a question about the identity provider. So the does EGI suggest to to be itself the identity provider and who is managing identities? Because this is a, uh, in my knowledge, this is a heavy task. I mean, uh, it requires resources, it requires people uh, adding users, it requires uh, secure systems. So, who is the identity provider? Do we have to set up an identity provider ourselves, or does EGI provide solutions, or, or I don't know? This will be covered, Diego, in, in the rest of the presentation. I suggest to come back to your questions at the end. Okay. Okay. So no. So it's okay. I will do the, the rest of the questions in the end. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I was muted. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. All the practical implementation are covered in the next slide. So thank you for the questions. Um, okay. Moving on. Uh, let me see. Okay, so uh, how is uh, precisely how is EGI uh, handling authentication at the moment? So what do we use? What is most used in EGI? Is not only used that, but what is most used in EGI? And the uh, X509 certificates. So you may know uh, about the technology of X509 certificate. I put a link to Wikipedia here in the slide. Uh, they are basically 
it's a public private key uh, infrastructure uh, and it is the main technology used in EGI. Uh, it is provided, so the certificates are provided by a framework, by a um, collaboration of identity providers um, who are part of the trust, uh, the international global trust framework or the UGRID PMA. There are different groups of certification authorities who release certificates in Europe. And the EGI services are configured to accept certificates released by the certification authorities federated in the above uh, collaborations. Uh, baseline is if a user have one IGTF personal certificate, <coughs> sorry, a user can, this user can authenticate in the uh, EGI, wherever in EGI he will be authenticated, doesn't mean he can actually be authorized because it depends on the VO membership, but definitely his name is uh, accepted, his credentials, sorry, are accepted in the EGI services. So how does it work, the, 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 the Certification Authority, Registration Authority framework? So the, 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 collab the GTF Collaboration International Global Trust Federation, it uh, contains, sorry, contains federate three other federations, which are the UGRID PMA for Europe. There is another one for US and for Asia. And this UGRID PMA and the other federation actually federate um, certification authorities who are, let's say, at national level, and which are the, the CA yellow boxes here. And uh, every certification authority has uh, agreement with a number, uh, many of them have a lot of registration authorities which is the, the lower level, the RA, um, who actually are distributed at institution level. So what happens is that all the institutions usually who need to have, um, um, to who, whom users need to have access to a certificate, set up registration authority where the user can have direct access, so it's Oh, oh, uh, user registration authorities ideally should be at walking distance from the users and uh, these registration authorities collaborate with the certification authorities and the certi certification authorities are the, the, the identities who actually create the certificates. So if a certificate is signed by any CA within the EUGRID PMA uh, or IGTF, uh, federation is automatically accepted by EGI. Uh, the, the IGTF collaboration makes sure that the, the certification authorities keep a level of assurance that is required. They have operational activities in place, um, operational procedures in place that are acceptable for both user and service providers, and they are the release. Uh, the IGTF release um, the, the configuration files that are used in every EGI service to, to configure the certification authority and ultimately to accept user, uh, user certificates. So how does it work then the, to obtain a certificate? So user makes a certificate request to the CA, to the certification authority there, which usually is one for every country, um, usually using a web browser, using a web interface, and they submit the request. Then the user uh, identity is confirmed by the registration authority, which is the, um, uh, the, the entity who actually needs to, to, to have a face-to-face uh, check of the user, ID check of the user, sign a paper which is then shipped to the CA, sent by email to the CA, uh, that confirm that the user is who he claim he is in the certificate request. This is why registration authority 
authorities are distributed in a very capillar way to the um, in the institution at uh, in the institution where the EGI uses. Um, then after the confirmation of the system authorities, the, the CA, the certification authority, uh, signed the certificate, uh, provides the certificate to the user, and the user downloads the certificate, usually from the website, the same website we use for the certification, so the, the registration of the request, and uh, it can be used for authentication. This is, uh, let's say, the, the common workflow. Uh, on top of this, as a, another possibility to have certificate, if you, your users own credential pro credentials provided by an identity uh, provided provider federated uh, in EduGain. So, do you have an EduGain uh, I credential? If so, you most probably can access the Terena certificate services, uh, the national, the um, the NRNs. Uh, many NRNs in Europe actually uh, have this service, so they can provide you a certificate, X509 certificate, recognized by, I mean, uh, part of the IGTR distribution recognized by the EGI services uh, without the need to, for you, for the, your users to go to a registration authority or, or contact uh, any other um, uh, institution uh, beside their identity provider to provide a credential to the Terena certificate service. This is the, the, this provides um, personal certificates, not short-term uh, credentials, so they can be used exactly as the other certificates. And um, uh, I put a link in the slide. You can click and go to the website where Terena publishes the list of NRNs who are actually uh, providing this service. Not all of the NRNs, unfortunately, but uh, really a lot of them. Then, uh, when a user has a certificate, uh, the second step, so with a certificate, the user has the authentication um, sorted out. To sort out also the authorization, the user needs to register to a virtual organization. Uh, then how to find a virtual organization uh, if the user is not in touch with uh, with a research community who already has a virtual organization in EGI, he can con check in EGI, in the EGI website, what are the virtual organizations uh, that are already working and may find uh, one, of, uh, one within the same discipline he's working, for example, or set up a virtual organization. But let's say that the user knows who's, um, for example, uh, a competence center user uh, uh, wants uh, to to access the competence center virtual organization, if there will be one. Um, he needs to get a certificate, and he has it at this point. And then to go to the uh, to the service that we are providing to the users to, to manage virtual organization, which is called VOMS, uh, Virtual Organization Management Service. It, is a, it, it has a web in, interface where user can register their requests, and VO managers can manage their uh, manage the um, the user requests. So what the user does once he has the personal certificate, submit a request to the VOM service. Then the the VO manager, if it's the case, approves the request. Adding all the attributes and roles <coughs> to the user request, so assigning all the, the, the actual capability to the user through the VOMS groups and roles. And of course, this the VO manager must know the, the user being in contact with him, so know that he's part of his collaboration. And, and this is basically it for to, to, to set up to authorize users to access the, the, the resources that are devoted to the research community. This is because all these specific VOM services, the specific VOM service uh, used by the virtual organization are configured by the EGI service providers who support the virtual organization. So basically, for the once 
a site is supporting the, the VO, the, there is no need for the use, VO manager to contact the service providers, the, the, the site, the resource centers to communicate changes in the VO membership because everything is done, done through the VOMS, through the VOMS server. So, <clears throat> how is then, as I said, there is no need for the use to the VO managers to contact the resource center. So, how does the, the authorization workflow work for um, for EGI? So, for this, sorry, in this scenario. So, on the left side, there's the user. Uh, on the bottom, the virtual organization. They call it the VO manager, and First step is the user has the certificate. The certificate contains information about the identity of the user, whose is institution, email, name, surname, etc. This is not about authorization, this is about authentication. So what the virtual organization through the VOMS does is to add additional information on the certificate, extending the, the, the certificate information and uh, with the uh, VOMS mem VO membership with uh, the other, the, um, the roles, etc., the other attributes, they are packaged together in, a, in the specific uh, X509 uh, scenario. They are packaged in a proxy certificate, which I will tell you about in two slides. But all this information packaged together, signed by everyone, basically by IGTF, virtual organization, by the user. Everybody signs everything, uh, cryptographically speaking, and it's shipped to the EGI. This is enough because these are all the information we need uh, as a service provider to accept or reject a user. This works because we trust IGTF to, to properly release credential to the users, and we trust virtual organization to properly check who's allowed or not allowed to use virtual organization resources, the resources pledged to the virtual organization. As I said, the key here is the trust and the collaboration. Because it will not scale without this delegation of responsibilities. Um, the user identity is, is verified by the IGTF, by the certification authorities, uh, who are, in most cases, operated by the national grid initiatives, the EGI partners. Uh, and this enable the certificate enable uniform authentication across resource centers. And on the other side, we delegate the authorization to the user community. They know who they are, they know who are their collaborators, uh, and they just need, we trust them to, to, to keep updated the information in the VOM server, uh, to keep updated the, the, the membership status of their users. And also we trust them that they disseminate the policies that we require to the user, the security policies that we require to the user to accept. In, so, in summary, with this uh, workflow, we can ensure uniform authentication and uniform authorization, uniform access right in the services across the whole infrastructure to the users. Um, so, how technically this information are shipped to the service provider? There, th this is done through a proxy certificate. Uh, basically, it's a the short-term credential, hopefully short-term, should be short-term, uh, credential uh, derived by uh, and signed with, with the user personal certificate. So proxy certificates can be uh, generated only by the user with his own certificate or her own certificate. Um, and they are generally used for delegation, uh, but it general for whole known interactive services, which is the majority of services that we have in EGI. Uh, what, is, what is important in the proxy is that it is self-contained. Let me, let me use this term. It carries all the information that service providers need to authenticate and authorize user at service level. 
basically the, the, the certificate has a has carries the same user certificate information name surname uh, email institution etc plus the VO information which are signed by the VOM server and are uh, and as I told you before VOM server are configured in every uh, EGI service okay this is how it works in principle so user has the certificate produce proxies signed with VOMs shipped to to the to the services and they get access um, this is can be quite uh, heavy weight for the users to handle certificate produce proxies etc etc in some in some cases users they just just don't want to to do it uh, it may slow their workflows their 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 productivity and we don't want that so what can be done is to hide this complexity behind a, a portal or a science gateway that are actually uh, allowing users to, to log in with username and password uh, in the website, in the portal, and they may not even have an X509 certificate, it depends on the use case. Um, so what the portal does is then use a robot certificate. Robot certificate, uh, it's a certificate which is owned by a, um, it's owned by a user, so a person, the, the portal administrator, for example, and but can generate programmatically uh, proxies. So uh, it can live in a machine it's usually stored in a in a USB key or in a soft particular piece of software there's no need for a user to add passwords for example to to generate uh, the proxy no interactive access is needed to generate the proxy so what is doing then is that the portal actually with the identity of the portal administrator not of the user is performing tasks on the uh, um, on the grid on the cloud on the infrastructures uh, on behalf of the user this has use issues because let's say the pros are above uh, this line the process that is easier for the user uh, to maintain for the user is faster uh, less um, problems less hassle for the users to um, I don't need to request certificate, etc. The issues is that all the collab users using the portal are actually using impersonating the portal administrator who requested the robot certificate. Authorization and logging uh, uh, responsibility are then moved to the portal, so the portal decides who can do what. Uh, the infrastructure we as service provider we don't know about the users. Uh, accounting is very hard uh, and there are security limitations in the end because we cannot really allow the anonymous user to do whatever they want and if something happened with that virtual organization all the users will be blocked because we will need to block the robot certificate so there are of course pros and cons nevertheless this is a very very uh, widely used solution by our users Okay, so this is this was my last slide about uh, um, the current state of the art in EGI. Um, now I will like to move on the evolution part, uh, and then we can probably uh, better have questions uh, at the end, since most of the topics that I will present now are related to the to the previous section, if you like. So this is what we have in production now what we are going to have in production soon very soon tomorrow or in one year it's part it's matter of the third part of the presentation okay let's start from where where we ended so how we can improve these robot certificates to take off all the limitation or some of the limitation they have to make them actually very useful tools for the users um, so so this is a little bit of repetition. This is so. The, the, this is are the issues: security limitation, non-accurate accounting, doing everything as the user are the the, the portal administrator. Um, 
So what we are testing right now, we hope to be in production very soon, at least for some use cases, is to uh, implement sub-proxies. So this is the proxy, uh, as you saw, as you, OK, this is the proxy as you saw it in the previous slide. What we are testing is to add an additional extension to the proxy, which includes the user ID. It's, uh, it's uh, basically another extension. This is the virtual organization extension. This is another extension, which may be, OK, may not be technically accurate, this thing, uh, this uh, diagram. But this is added by the portal, by the Science Gateway. And this includes information that can identify univocally the user. The user don't have a proxy, uh, sorry, a certificate, but these three um, part of the proxy are univoc, unique for every user. This is what we are. This is again not uh, is not a technically a, a big development that we are doing. It's from a policy, from a security point of view, is something we, we need to to understand the rules to to do it effectively. How we can do it effectively. But this will allow users to um, to use robot certificate uh, and be authenticated authenticated to to be themselves in our infrastructure. Uh, this improves user tracking. Uh, basically, service provider will get different credentials. They are not really different. They are the same robot certificate. They are they are just the extensions, but. This is enough for the service provider to block the users without blocking everyone using that robot certificate. OK, so I just want to stop here a moment. Don't, uh, if I talk a lot about block user and suspending users in this presentation, don't get it wrong. It doesn't happen very often at all. But it's important for us to be able to do so. Uh, it's important for users as well, because we don't want user community don't want their user to misbehave because they have limited resources, the user community, because everything is limited in this universe. And um, and of course, user community don't want their own resources to be uh, burned by malicious or user who acquired credential of another user or errors done mistakes, honest mistakes uh, submitted by their users. So it's important for both to have a security, some security in place. <clears throat> Another important thing is that uh, using robot certificate, all the users are sharing the same credential, meaning that it's not possible for users to, uh, to isolate the users. So this is a kind of, it's a little bit technical. I don't want to go into this, but uh, just to add that this for 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 the user uh, is also important that if in this way users can submit a job and be sure that another user submitting a job on the same machine won't end up sharing the same working area. Ultimately, this is also very useful for accounting. Um, we can account how many users are there, how many users are using our infrastructure. This is a very, I think, is it's a very good improvement for to the robot certificate, and it is potentially it can be used really, really, really soon. There are other alternatives, more elegant, like online CA certification authorities who are actually uh, uh, identity certification authority who provide short-lived credential uh, based on that can be downloaded uh, by the user and used for a for a short term and then uh, ask again for another credential for this the next iteration uh, this 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 has potential and it's it's another good solution that we are of course we will of course uh, uh, explore uh, but at the moment robot certificates are actually the the technology that is can be used right now <clears throat> and we uh, so based on your basically on your requirements on your use cases we can implement either. Okay, so then 
so far I talk about X509 uh, technology, but it's also I don't think, we don't think that this is the only technology we will be using in EGI. So for some users, uh, this is a barrier for any reason. They don't have access to certification authorities. They, it's too complicated or they don't want to have this uh, responsibility to, to keep safe their uh, certificate or for any reason. And of course, we, we want to, to, to help to our users, our uh, stakeholders, to be happy with their, their experience in EGI. So what probably the, the most effective solution will be to bridge other identity federations. So we have IGTF for the certificate. But we, our plan, what we want to do based on the requirements of the user, is to um, to, to bring the EduGain, uh, the EduGain Federation, which is, uh, I have a slide afterwards about that, and their institutional identity provider based on other technology like SAML or OAuth, for example, and bridge them, integrate them in EGI. Uh, this will require some technical work. We need credential translation uh, or extend the support the, the, the software we have, our services to support these technologies. <clears throat> in particular, the, the credential translation is important because we cannot expect to, to support every possible technology in every service. So a credential translation that can translate, for example, SAML to X509 will be very handy and transparent for the user, almost transparent for the user, to assess everything they need in EGI. But also we need to have policy in place to build trust between the service providers and the identity providers as we did together with, with IGTF. And we uh, want to enable different level of trust to use different level of trust in EGI because again there is no need to have always X509 certificate with ID verification for everything you are going to do. So the target is to have flexible authentication. So we want to extend the current authentication mechanism and enable users to choose what they want to be flexible and um, use lower level of assurance if needed, uh, use other technologies, SAML, OAuth, uh, social media uh, credential for low risk application and integrate them uh, in the EGI services. This is <clears throat> this is not always as easy, uh, but uh, but this is of course a, how we want to support uh, the, our user in the future. And then we will have solved the authentication part. And then, as you remember, the second A is still there. It is the authorization. How we can handle it in a federated way without using certificates. Basically, the idea is to keep the same keep the same framework, provide the tools to the users to manage their user communities. Uh, they may be VOMs, they may not be VOMs, they may be other attribute authorities um, connected with, the, with their identity providers. Um, well, they can be used, they can be used not only for EGI, by EGI, but they can be used by the say not only by the EGI services, but these tools are already used and by many communities for their internal uh, organization to access documents, to access databases, etc. So in this way we are our plan is to use the same attribute authorities the user are already using or the same technology. Sorry, the users are already using I use them as well in EGI. Uh, this will allow to maintain the uniform authorization across multiple service providers based on the attributes provided by the user committee. Again, this is how we are doing it now uh, with external certificate. And go back to applying the collaborative trust approach. So we uh, will trust the user community in managing the, the attributes. We will trust the identity provider in managing in the credentials and we will build another framework of trust 
with EGI identity providers and user communities. So EDUGAIN is the Pan-European Federation of National IDP Federations. <coughs> um, it includes most of the identity providers used by, used by researchers in Europe. Uh, the national federations are handled by the NRNs mostly. There, there are still some limitations because not all the identity providers are part of the game federation. This can be, let's say, probably easily sold. But for many use cases, uh, I mean, we, st we will still need to have a one-to-one -one communication between identity providers and service providers. Uh, sorry, uh, this line is not finished. Some IDPs, I was saying, <clears throat> Some IDPs are not releasing the, all the attributes we need, so this is also another another problem. Um, so fortunately, there is an action, European action, the ARC project. I will talk about a little bit later. Uh, will start soon, and it will start try to overcome the part of these limitations. Okay, so how? Uh, EGI can support in this AI integration. Uh, this is a possible scenario. User has an IDP. We have this IDP. It's not maintained by us. It's maintained by another institution. Let's say our home institution. And we want to access EGI. Well, this is not as easy because there will be probably need to have some bureaucracy, some agreement at the moment between the IDPs and the services provided by EGI. And this is, and services provided maybe really every single site. So there is need to, 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 to put some effort, uh, sometimes a lot of effort, to, to do all the paperwork, uh, all the, to build the trust, to make sure that the service provider can access uh, the identity provider and get some attributes if needed. So, one way we can support this is to show the EGI Federation as a single service provider to use a service proxy, let's say, uh, which is a technical service but is also a, a, a policy thing, because EGI we act as a whole towards the identity provider. Then we just need to agree the policies uh, and the, to agree the use case with, with once with the identity provider. And if you need two identity providers, then we can do it twice, rather than uh, having an exponential, uh, no, sorry, uh, a quadratic uh, increase of uh, interaction between services and identity providers. And we can also uh, provide the attribute authorities for the um, for the users to to manage the the attributes that basically can then be added to the information of the identity provider, as I showed you before, to, to regulate authorization in the EGI Federation. So this is, let's say, one possible way we can support you in integrating identity providers in EGI, if you need those identity providers to be used with us. Not necessarily the only way. Uh, of course, this is based on the on the requirement we will receive from you, from the from the other users. <clears throat> and uh, what I didn't write in these slides, and my bad, is that, that all these activities have funding. So all this evolution of EGI AI has funding in the EGI Engage project. So we will support our users with the EGI Engage project. Uh, in particular, the competence center, but also all the other user communities that are relevant, uh, who are who want to use EGI. Then, the other action besides EGI Engage, which again is dedicated to our users, in EGI Engage we will do what our users want. There is another uh, European very important action. We are collaborating with that. It is the authentication authorization for research and collaboration. Uh, it's a European project to uh, 
submitted to, to evolve the collaboration model across uh, institutional uh, countries, cross countries, uh, between uh, IDPs and service provider and user community. To build this trust framework, this policy framework that I discussed briefly before. There are a lot of actors in this project, EGI of course, S3 cluster, the, the National AAI Federation, etc. So a lot of a lot of uh, people is involved in this project. I will say the relevant people, hopefully. Uh, what this project will do is to design how the a real Pan-European Federation works uh, with testing, pilot testing, etc. Done within the project. EGI in particular will participate to this testing. We'll bring our user communities requirement and to integrate them with the existing uh, with our workflow to make it work with our services. Uh, it is starting the first of May. This project so very soon. Um, yeah, sorry if the the balloons here are covering one one uh, <coughs> part of the slide because. I forgot probably to add the animation here. But anyway, this is the, the, the structure of the project. And in particular, GI.U uh, is participating to the, the design work package, the JRE one, for, to bring the, the requirements of our communities. <coughs> and the SA1 work package, which is about deploying pl uh, pilot and test with our services, with our users, the outputs of the, of the project. Um, particularly, we want to test the attribute authority solution for community management because it's something that is very relevant for us. Okay, so uh, this we are almost at the end of this presentation. It was longer than I expected, um, and I have some summaries right now. So, what are our current services for AAI? Uh, we provide, uh, through our NGI, through EU Group PMA, uh, we have a network of certification authorities to release credentials to the users. Let's say that some users don't have access to them, but if a user really wants to have a certificate, there are ways to, 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 to obtain it. We have a catch-all certification authority, as is Terena certification, certificate service. <coughs> so if users want a certificate, they can have it. Uh, this I will allow users to access, uh, to be authenticated in every services. Um, we provide VO uh, management services to, to manage the membership of the user to the VO, to the rule, the, their uh, attributes, their groups. Uh, and we also provide, or NGI or virtual organization do by themselves, provide science gateways to use other types of authentication, username and password, for example, uh, edugain, some other use, um, still username and password, you will say, uh, and through robot certificate to access EGI services as well. No need for the users to have a certificate, some limitation, but still a uh, real, really good solution for the users. This is what we have now. So, Already, user can use their username and password, edugain, etc., to access CGI through the, the the science gateway. What is the future for EGI? Uh, this, of course, will be based on the requirements and use cases. Um, <clears throat> um, so we want to integrate our services with the federation, IDP federation, let's say edugain, and individual identity providers. We want to do that to make it easier to do it. We want to make it easier for the users to, to bring their IDPs and use them in EGI. And this is not for tomorrow. This is, let's say, we will have probably some results during this year. Uh, but still, it's, it's important for us to get requirements to get to take the right direction. Um, we will provide more attribute, author attribute authorities for the user, for example, SAML-based or uh, other, uh, other technology-based, based on the requirements of the user, so the users don't need to, to do too much work to assess them. They can use their identity, their credential 
go to the attribute authorities, and then perhaps using a credential translation then to us a CGI. Um, <clears throat> but again, what we are aiming to is to to reduce really the problems, the barrier, the barriers for the users who are assessing EGI. Ultimately, to better support collaboration between users. The, because the current trust architecture has proven to be scalable and to work, we empower the user communities to regulate access to their resources. We build trust between the three entities, the, the identity provider, users, and service providers. And we just need, well, uh, it may not be a very easy job, but we need to, to extend this approach by integrating other authentication technology, extending a, the current X509 with other technologies, uh, link the attribute authorities using this, who use, that use this technology with our infrastructure and with Edugain and with other identity providers. So, because it's not only about installing a, a service for attribute authority, this service needs to be accepted by the service provider, and this is easy if we own it, if we uh, deploy it, but it must be also accepted by the identity providers, because they will uh, release attributes to, the, to these attribute authorities at some point. So this is something that we want to make easier for the user, to bring their identity providers and use it productively. Um, so, how we want to, then, sorry, then the, 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 the last step is, this is all about EGI Engage, then the next step is we want also to proxy the requirements for the competence centers and the other user community and bring it to a European level within the ARC project uh, in other European coordination actions in order to make sure that the user community of EGI are represented uh, at European level uh, if they are not, say, in person, because they are already participating, the user community, in these actions through EGI. Um, so this is, le le let me say that our main goal in EGI Engage is to make productive our user. But being our collaborate, being uh, us collaborating in, in uh, ARC, what we do if users uh, work with us, if the user community, the community cell work with us in building the new AAI infrastructure for EGI, it will be also compatible with the outputs and using the outputs of the ARC project because this coordination action is what we are uh, we really aim to do so we are not we will not repeat any uh, duplicate work in EGI engage uh, although we we they say given that the the user requirements are not diverging with the direction of arc but uh, it's very unlikely because we will be there to bring your requirements to arc so you will be uh, hopefully you will be com compatible. Uh, your solution that you're using EGI will be also compatible e with the outputs of ARC, th therefore compatible and interoperable with other e infrastructures. Okay, th this was my last slide. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, so this is the end of my presentation. Now, of course, this is the Q&A session. And I, I just want to add that at the EGI conference in Lisbon on the Friday, there will be a long AAI session where really we'll develop all these topics, in particular the forward-looking topics, to start really putting down the requirements agreed on the roadmap. So it's very, very important for all the competence center, all the user community who may have some interest in that, which I guess is most of them, to have representative on Friday at the EGI conference in Lisbon, because there is where we will really try to 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 kickstart this whole activity. <laughs>